see. Syzygy, do you mean the font on my uh, slide? Yeah, I'm not sure I can really fix that. The font is small. I'm mostly focusing on the pictures anyway. Yeah, you have to zoom on it. Um, a lot of the slides were really made for my uh, for the website. This is the website in case anybody wants to go on it. So this is the um, the website where I have just basically my own, my own hobby website where I have basically these slides in, in a website version. So what I what I guess I'll do is just kind of walk through some of the images in my uh, in basically on my website um, and talk about each topic. And I'm happy to, to go slow or um, take any questions in local. I don't think you guys can talk voice, but you can post your questions in local chat and I'm happy to reply. I can't really see IMs because it's it's too much to check IMs, so please use local. So just as background, um, let's see. Yeah, right. I'll try to focus on the pictures. I mean, it, it is too hard really to, to get into the detail on this kind of thing. So basically, my interest in particular in astrobiology, which is generally the search for life on uh, beyond Earth, um, my interest especially is in, the, is in uh, the search for microbial life, so like bacteria, that kind of thing, um, on uh, beyond Earth, especially if it's, it's life that's cellularly very different and separately evolved from life on Earth, that would be fascinating. So that's, that's sort of my interest. I think a huge development, sort of the gorilla in the middle of the room, recent years in terms of the search for microbial life beyond Earth is that um, there appear to be large subsurface oceans on moons in the solar system, maybe even on, on Mars, but at least in moons, like moons of Jupiter um, uh, and Saturn, so um, if, if those, it's pretty clear that those subsurface oceans actually exist uh, underneath generally um, a large amount of ice. They have liquid water, and where there's large amounts of liquid water, there may very well be, um, there may very well be life, at least that's what's, uh, that's what the thought is, since, since life just basically loves or needs water, life as we know it anyway. So I think that's just a fascinating thing. So that's what got me interested. In my graduate studies, I did research on extremophile bacteria. These are bacteria that live under really weird, difficult conditions like extreme salinity, extreme heat, etc. And uh, that led me to get interested in the possibility that there could be differently evolved cellular life that extremophiles, right? Um, and exomoons, sure. Syzygy, yeah. I mean, this is a fascinating thing. There's, there's just a, uh, uh, the whole neighborhood of the sun. 50, 100 light years is filled with other star systems, planets, moons that may be better candidates than moons in the solar system for harboring life, and even may have surface uh, liquid water, which is generally uh, it's not believed to exist right now in the solar system. The problem with exomoons is that you're just really far away. You've got to go to a different star, a different star system. Whereas, of course, the planets and the moons revolving around the planets on Earth are very close, relatively speaking. Um, yeah, I'm, I don't know, I'm, I have some slides on exomoons that I could take a look at. It, it seems like there's good evidence that there are, well, there are clearly exoplanets, right? And there seems to be some pretty good, although indirect, evidence of exomoons. But there could even be life on exoplanets. Um, it's just that it's, it seems like it's very hard to get real detailed information about um, astronomical objects that are just that far away. Right. So that, I mean, I think it's intriguing, but as far as like relatively near term possibilities, search for life beyond Earth, it seems to me that it's in our, it's in our neighborhood. It's in the solar system. There's huge lakes under the surface of ice on Europa, on Enceladus, you know, moons of planets in the solar system. And it seems to me there's a good chance of life uh, uh, in those uh, bodies of water underneath the surface of these moons. So I should really probably start to go through some of these slides. So I'm actually looking at my website and kind of matching it up. So, but, but feel free if anyone has thoughts in, in local chat or wants me to focus on anything, I'm happy to do so. So um, I already talked about the general search for, for life on Earth. Um, so let me see, what would be the next slide to go to? Um, so I don't know how, wh whether I should start kind of with the uh, 
older stuff, but I guess I will. So there was something called the Yuri Miller apparatus, um, where it was determined that you can you can find um, uh, you can sort of create the conditions for early life, and what you get is um, chemicals that develop that suggest that life could have evolved from the conditions that were present on primitive Earth. I want to pull up that slide for a second. Let me just see here. No, that's not it. One, a two. Sorry, just let me pull up the correct slide. It's a little hard to organize slides in Second Life. And nine. so, um, let's see. That uh, day, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, says that work was done at my alma mater, University of Chicago. I didn't know that. Um, haven't the Yuri Miller conditions been questioned, Sumo says. You know, I'm not sure. I mean, everything I've read about it suggests that it may not prove everything, but it proves a lot. At least if, if you guys can see the slide with the colored, with the colored uh, rectangles, I think it, the basic theme of this seems to be uh, continued to be valid uh, or sort of confirmed. You start with water vapor, and you've just got simple gases, methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and you apply... Uh, they, uh, in this uh, experiment, applied repeated application of electrical sparks to basically to simulate primitive lightning. And what you get out of it is simple organic compounds, which include amino acids, which are the building blocks of life. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to get cells out of the deal. It doesn't prove that life could have evolved. But it suggests that complex uh, amino acids, which are critical to life, could have happened through this natural random process. And I think it at least points to the possibility of the evolution of life. Let's see, Yuri Miller is decades old. What follow-ups have been done to fine tune the conditions? Baragon, I don't know. I, that I don't know. Um, I feel like it kind of was like proof of principle that you can get complex life important chemicals developing um, through random conditions similar to that that was present on early. Let's see. To have such simple conditions for cycling materials for a short amount of time and have it produce organic chemicals is impressive. Yeah, I mean, I find that at least it's it's uh, suggestive that the possibility of evolution of complex uh, life important chemicals, if not cells, is possible. So, uh, but yeah. All right. So let me move on. Um, so, in in my my area of interest, water is is crucial. So as far as people know. Water is fundamental to life. So that doesn't mean that there isn't life out there that doesn't depend on water, but life as we know it is completely dependent on, on water. You have to have water for all the chemical processes to exist, for cells to exist, um, and so forth. So I'm going to put up a slide that I think is interesting. The water topic, although it may be a little complex. So hang on just one second while I pull up a slide that I'd like to show about water. Uh, let me read. Well, uh, let's see. I guess no subsequent demonstrations contradict the findings of the original experiment. Baragat, I think that's true. I mean, to be fair, I think later experiments suggested that just because you show that amino acids can develop from these primitive conditions doesn't really prove that life could have evolved. And I think that's correct. But I think it is suggestive. Uh, let's see. And it says, right, haven't thoughts about what those conditions. Yeah, that's another thing, Sumo. I remember reading that. that the, the, that's an important point, that the primeval conditions might have been much different than, than, people, than people thought. And so the conditions of the Uri Miller apparatus might really not be relevant to the time period. However, I still think it proves the principle. I think if you change around the conditions, um, you'd still probably find that, you know, the principle continues to be valid that you can get complex life important molecules developing from relatively random conditions. Anyway, so in this slide, so this is kind of a complex slide, but I don't know, it's kind of my pet topic. So I guess I'll focus on it for a minute. So, so basically, uh, let's see, uh, right, those uh, agree, those molecules can, yeah, that's it. That's about it, Sumo. So anyway, so, okay, so life on Earth requires water. So and, and we've recently found, scientists have recently found that there are these huge bodies of subsurface oceans on moons in the solar system. 
And it wasn't wasn't believed that that was the case previously. Why? Because to have liquid water, you need you need pressure and you need heat. If you don't have pressure, it all evaporates, and you don't have liquid water. It's got to be sort of pressed down, and you also need heat to keep it warm, or it's going to be ice. So how do you get that? There's a couple of ways that you can get it. Let me just read a tagline: For anything resembling life processes at the speed to which we are accustomed requires a solvent medium. It seems. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, something lifelike that lives with processes at very slow rates could be difficult to perceive. Not look for it. Yeah, that's all. I think that's all true. So there's possibilities that life could exist separately from water as a solvent, um, even potentially separate from liquids as solvents. But it would have to be radically different from life on Earth. So like the best guess is that if we're going to find life, even if it's pretty different from life on Earth, it's probably going to be found in liquid water. Liquid water has a a myriad uh, of qualities which cause it to be amenable to the processes of life as we know it. So anyway, um, so in this slide, the basic gist here is you've got a couple of ways that um, <laughs> a couple of ways that you can get liquid water. And one is on Earth, how do you have liquid water? You've got this large gravity from the planet, and you've also got heat from the sun. Um, and that pressure plus the heat from the sun can give you liquid water. So, but it turns out that you can get liquid water on moons in the solar system that don't really have enough heat. So you would think you would just have ice. But on moons like Europa, it turns out that the, the varying distances of Europa from Jup Jupiter cause like a pulling and a like a, 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 a contracting and an expansion, which creates friction, which creates heat. So the pull, the tidal forces create heat, and then those tidal forces right. And the tidal forces from the pull of Jupiter and the back and forth um, create enough heat to, to create liquid water. And that's what this is supposed to show. Now, you still need pressure. And on Europa, you have that pressure from, could be several miles worth of solid ice. But you could then have liquid water underneath that ice. And although there are other conditions necessary for life, if you've got a subsurface ocean of liquid water, I think that's, that's a convincing start that you might have life. So this is sort of these are sort of the funda some of the fundamental uh, things that got me interested in this whole topic is is that there's oceans of liquid water underneath the surface of moons right in the solar system that may very well have life, or at least I think that may have life because liquid water and life just seem to go hand in hand. So um, there's a lot of other aspects to my presentation. Let's see what should I talk about next though? I want to talk about something. Um, something interesting visually, maybe biochemistry. So um, I'll start with biochemistry. Um, so let me see. I'm going to go to my slide on biochemistry. One, a seven. Hang on one second while I pull up this slide. Um, So this is just basically a visual. Um, so it, it turns out that, um, uh, li yeah, life on Earth, uh, it, it's sort of interesting. Life on Earth uses glucose as pretty much the sole medium of energy exchange. Everything, all life on Earth, pretty much, depends on glucose in one way or another for energy. It's interesting to think that if we found life on, on other planets or moons, if it used anything else other than glucose for energy, that would be intriguing. It would be a whole different cellular metabolism. So this is something. If we find life beyond Earth and it's different than, uh, uh, than life on Earth, um, then we have a sense that how life can be different and wh where we can look to find different types of life, etc. cetera. <laughs> um, so um, all life on Earth is pretty streamlined. So if we find it beyond Earth and it's evolved separately and very different, it would be just an intriguing, an intriguing thing. And again, if anybody has questions or wants me to focus on any particular topics, just let me know. Otherwise, I'm basically going to go through the half a dozen or so major topics in my, uh, on my website uh, and, uh, and just deal with questions from there. And maybe talk about some current topics, too, possibility of uh, liquid water on the surface of Mars. All right, so let's see. What's next on my um, uh, cellular metabolism is something I talk about on my website, but it's, it's kind of detailed. I think let's go to Europa. 
So just give me one second while I pull up my slide for Europa. One. Okay. Okay, so let's see. Let me read this as it goes along. Um, because of too much honey, it comes at the desk. Do you think Perseverance rover will find life in the Jezero crater on Mars in February? So, uh, Day, I don't know about that. Um, uh, I'm not familiar with the details there. Um, I think if I, I don't think there's life on Mars, actually. I, I doubt that there's even liquid water in or on Mars. I think it's dead, but I could be wrong. There's recent evidence, recent articles that suggest that there could be active magma inside of Mars that creates liquid subsurface lakes on Mars. And if there's underground water, then I would love to be wrong because then there, there could potentially, I think, be life and increases the chances of life dramatically. But, but Mars just seems too cold for that, and I'm not really buying the magma thing, but I don't know. Uh, maybe more research is to be done on it. Anyway, so... Uh, uh, I'm kind of more excited about some place like Europa. That's the subject of this slide. So if you look at this slide, the 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 basic thing is, um, but let me just read this. Perseverance rover is looking for fossil life. I mean, I don't know. Fossil life seems unlikely to me too. I think it's like if there was life on Mars, it would have to be many millions of years ago. And I, it's hard for me to believe that the fossils would even be bindable. Um, doesn't magma imply tape? plate tectonics, Mars has no tectonics. Barragon, I'm not sure, but I, I, but it does seem surprising to me that there would be active magma on Mars. Um, so I'm not so sure about that. Um, but yeah, I think it's under, under, underground water on Mars, subsurface lakes on Mars that are the, that, that's the thought. But again, I'm, I'm not yet convinced on it. Anyway, so Europa, what is Europa? Europa is a moon of Jupiter, and it's, a lot of people have heard of Europa for good reason. It's a moon in the solar system where people think, scientists think, that there could potentially be life. So if you look at this slide, just basically, um, let me just read this though. Olympus Mons is the largest volcano in the solar system on Mars. Quite that, well, that's the thing, right. I mean, could there have been life on Mars 50 million years ago? I think, yeah, absolutely, maybe. Now, I doubt it. Anyway, but Europa, here's a different, a different story. The, the, the yellow surface of Europa, you can think of that as largely ice. Um, and then rocky ice. And then that blue part, though, that's an enormous subsurface ocean uh, underneath the surface ice on Europa. It's almost certain that this, this unlike the, the Mars thing on Europa, this subsurface ocean, ocean almost certainly exists. And um, there could be um, hydrothermal vents. These, these hydrothermal vents are very important because, um, let's see, I think that hydrothermal vents are kind of like underwater volcanoes. What they do is they, they can stir up the water, they can mix uh, um, minerals and uh, um, uh, other chemicals into the water and create the conditions that could possibly allow that mix for life in the liquid water. Um, so, and, and I, uh, as I recall, there's evidence that there could be hydrothermal vents uh, in Europa that could you know, combined with the subsurface oceans, potentially present conditions that are similar to hydrothermal vents on Earth. And in, in hydrothermal vents on Earth, that is, these, these underwater volcanoes at the bottom of oceans, there is life around them. From the heat and the minerals and the flow that they create, you have large uh, ecosystems of life around these hydrothermal vents on Earth. Could something like that be the case on Europa? I think absolutely it could be. So I think that's exciting. Read this. Plate tectonics on Mars has been debated, oh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I don't know enough about plate tectonics on Mars. It just seems like Mars might have had life, but it was millions of years ago. Now, I don't know. Um, then, uh, Gitaka was what got me looking into the possible life on Europa. Thing. I don't know what Gitaka is, Violet. Hydrothermal vent life demonstrates that life doesn't need sunlight to exist. Baragon, yeah, that's a key thing that I didn't mention. Um, uh, it used to be that people believed that that you needed, uh, you needed sun, light for life. So that that's a whole different thing. And then you'd need surface water. But here you have life w way under the ocean that it's provided everything it needs, not by the sun, but by the heat and the minerals that come from the underwater volcanoes, the hydrothermal vents. And that, and and if there's life in Europa, it's not going to be driven by sunlight. It's going to have to be driven by something like a hydrothermal vent. So that's a key point. There is life in the Earth hundreds of meters below. Roger, and yeah, I mean, I think that would be the hydrothermal vent thing. And that's what's so exciting about this. I mean, once you know that there's 
subsurface oceans on moons in the solar system. You combine that with the very real possibility of hydrothermal vents, which are like underwater volcanoes, just like we have on Earth. Why wouldn't you have life on other planets? It, it, it almost seems like it would probably be the case. NASA is planning a submarine rover called Cryobot to look, to look for life on the oceans. They, I didn't know that. I love it. I, I really feel like, I, honestly, I feel like the money should be spent on that kind of thing as opposed to like landing on the moon again or landing on Mars based on what we know now. Um, uh, looking for signs of life above or at uh, Europa, Enceladus, moons in the solar system, to me, that's, that's so much more bang for the buck. Anyway, okay, so I should probably go on. Um, maybe let's look at Titan. I think Titan is an exciting possibility for life beyond Earth. Um, um, so, image that I have isn't as exciting as the possibility for life, but let me pull it up anyway. 1A9. So, this here is uh, an image of uh, uh, the surface, essentially, of, of Titan. Um, it, 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 see, but it's believed that it may have subsurface liquids, even though it doesn't have much to look at on its surface. Um, and there's even been evidence that uh, it's got a thin atmosphere, as I recall. And in its thin atmosphere, there are chemicals that suggest the possibility of life metabolic processes happening. There's been speculation that there could be uh, microbes. Also, there's believed to be hydrocarbon surface lakes on Titan. So now we're not talking about subsurface, but surface lakes of, or, or bodies of, of not water, but bodies of liquid, hydrocarbon liquids. And there's some evidence that there could be an exchange of gases with the thin atmosphere of Titan and these hydrocarbon lakes that could suggest the presence of life. Uh, so Titan is also really interesting. Um, yeah, and, and an atmosphere is an important thing because then you can have surface liquid. And when you have surface liquid, you can have a gas exchange with an atmosphere, and that seems to increase the possibility. Um, all right, so that's Titan, um, which hasn't been focused on, but I think it's, it's, it's important. Then another one is Enceladus. This is another moon in the solar system that I think is a, a significant candidate for life. Um, again, Enceladus has... Um, has a subsurface liquid ocean, a lot like, I guess I won't go on about that because it's pretty similar to Europa. It's less exciting on its surface, but it's got subsurface oceans and it could have volcanic activity, so it could have life. So let me read what's going on. Um, if anybody has trouble hearing me, please let me know, but I guess you would have let me know. Um, all right, let's see what else. Titan used to be, let me read this actually. Titan used to be the darling for E.T. Live. You know, Baragon, I didn't know that. I thought I discovered Titan. <laughs> Evidently, I'm late to the party. But maybe maybe it's a good candidate. All right. So uh, moving on. So, so there are these moons in the solar system with subsurface oceans of liquid water that could harbor life. Um, but there's other possibilities for life that seem speculative, but are, it, it's not, I don't think, that hard to believe that there could be non water solvents for life. So ammonia is one possible solvent for life. Um, uh, and Titan uh, uh, would, would be a candidate for that. So let me pull up my slide on that real quick. So this is one. Okay, sorry for the slight delay. Let me pull up this slide. Hang on just one second for me. Here it is, I think. Sirens of Titan is my favorite Vonnegut. Yeah, you know, I never read Sirens of Titan. It sounds fun. So this is um, kind of a complex slide. Again, a public slide that I lifted. But um, ammonia is a non-liquid uh, possible solvent for life other than water. And ammonia water mixtures uh, that may, may exist on Titan. Uh, or in Titan, uh, in on subsurface, uh, and so it's possible that life can can exist um, in these uh, hydrocarbons, um, but it would have to be much different than life on Earth. But these hydrocarbons are liquids at extremely low temperatures, which means that there could be life 
uh, in or on uh, moons or bodies where temperatures are extremely low, where water couldn't exist or probably doesn't exist in liquid form, but hydrocarbons could. So that's something else that makes the idea of um, uh, hydrocarbons uh, as a solvent for life uh, really interesting. Um, anyway, so let's see. Um, another possibility for a hydrocarbon solvent for life is methane. And um, I'm not a chemist, but Titan also is believed to have surface lakes of hydrocarbons, including methane and ethane. And it has an atmosphere. So, so yeah, I mean, I guess that's why Titan has, has been sort of a darling. Um, so here's an interesting photo. This is an image of Titan showing light reflecting off its liquid uh, liquid seas. I mean, it's pretty cool. You're, you're actually going to be looking at sun reflecting off the surface of liquid lakes uh, on Titan. Let's see. Well, on a 10B. So I'm going to pull that slide up from my inventory just to give you a quick look. I think this is it. No, that's not it. Hang on while I just pull this slide up. Sorry, this is taking a minute. I'm not finding this. Sorry, one second. One A ten. Hopefully, this will be worth it in just a second. Right. So this is it. So that took a while. Sorry about that. But. If you can see this image, that the bright spots here are is is believed to be light uh, uh, sunlight, at literally bouncing off liquid hydrocarbon oceans on Titan. Uh, let's see, would ammonia with a high PhD be good for life? Yes, would have to construct methane-based life inside out, chemically speaking, with Rupert. Yeah, right. Yeah, I agree. L life based on uh, ammonia as a solvent would be really different from life on Earth. So it, it's pretty speculative, but it's possible. And you get liquid hydrocarbon lakes um, on Titan, so that, that also increases the probability for life when you have the gas exchange with the atmosphere. So that's another interesting possibility. Um, let's see. So moving on. Um, so, okay. In my presentation, uh, or on my what, let's see. Uh, high pressure and temperature chemistry is different. Yeah, so you, you guys know more about the chemistry, I think, than I do. My general sense of it is that life based on anything or using anything other than water as a solvent would have to be pretty radically different than life on Earth. Um, right, but it's possible and it's interesting. I mean, I still think, you know, you, the, the low-hanging fruit are the subsurface liquid water oceans of moons in the solar, solar system, and maybe Mars, maybe I'll come back to Mars. But... Um, it's also interesting to look at some sort of uh, speculative possibilities, and that's one of them. Now, speaking of speculative possibilities, um, yeah, um, another, so the, the home run of astrobiology is radio SETI, so the search for extraterrestrial intelligence um, using uh, uh, radio um, transmissions. So it turns out that, that radio transmissions can, can go hundreds, potentially, of light years, massively distant, and not degrade, or, or in some cases not be blocked. So it's possible that radio transmissions could come from civilizations sending them from many light years away from a planet in a different star system, and although it would take a long time, it could reach Earth, and we could find it. I mean, and of course, that's that's been the subject of some movies. So maybe I'll start with uh, one of my favorite slides. Um, just give me one second. I haven't figured out a way to organize my SL inventory efficiently yet. Maybe someday I will. Just hang on for me. So, one of my favorite actresses, Jodie Foster, uh, 
this is a shot from the movie, the 1997 movie Contact, where she, yeah, that's right, where she finds, um, uh, listens and, and, and detects a, a signal, seems to be a repeating regular signal that could suggest intelligent life sent it. My friend worked on the movie. Oh, that's interesting, Shiloh. I'd like to hear more about that. Anyway, so um, I think this is just intriguing. This seems like really sci-fi stuff. I don't think it's that radical. My personal view is that it seems likely that intelligent life does exist throughout the galaxy. It's probably just really spread out. And because it's really spread out, not just in space, but in time, you have to have a real confluence of events to find it. I don't know that much about the radio telescope work, but it seems like, man, it's a big spectrum. It's very hard to, to, to survey it all in detail. They're, they're working on it even now with the SETI projects. But it's, it's, everything I can determine seems like it is entirely possible that there could be life. It could be 50, 100, 200 light years away sending radio transmissions. They get to Earth that we find. And although it'll be very old, we could literally be listening in on the messages from extraterrestrial life. So I just think it's cool. I think it's still possible, too. It seems like it, I wish I knew more about the radio telescope part, but it seems like it really hasn't been done yet, that the whole spectrum hasn't been fully checked out. Um, let's see, indeed very big, but usually searches are, Syzygy, I'd love to talk to you about this sometime, but usually searches are around the H21 centimeter line or the OH18 centimeter line. Yeah, you know more about this than me. I wasn't. I mean, if I can't find it from Google or Wiki, it's hard for me. You know, I can't be. I, I don't. I don't have that much depth in it. However, um, that sounds interesting. So I want to pull up another slide. This is called the Cosmic Waterhole. Um, so, let's see. It, let me see if it's. I'm just trying to find a slide that's a little bit visually. The slide maybe isn't too visual, but it, but it's interesting in concept. One. One A. So let me just pull it up, and I'll talk about it. So this isn't going to look like much, but I'll, I'll bet some of you, perhaps, uh, perhaps Syzygy or others, might understand this better than I do. Let me see. If organic intelligence is leapfrogged by computer intelligence, the H and O lines may not be the right place to look. I don't know. I mean, so my my limited research suggests that there are these places in the spectrum. So we're talking now, what are we talking about? Radio transmission. So there's got to be life out there with radio transmission capability sending out radio signals. Then maybe we find these signals and we sense a pattern, a repeating pattern. And then we can check into it further and maybe find patterns under that pattern and basically decode messages. It's not a simple process, but it's conceivable. So how would that happen? You would have to have radio transmissions that get to you without uh, uh, noise. You have to be able to clearly see them. So this, this slide kind of demonstrates that it's believed that there are places in the spectrum, which I think Syzygy was probably referring to a moment ago, where you could send messages that would be unlikely to be interfered with by natural sources. So you could send them over light years, and it could be received, and if another intelligent life form gets them, they could find the patterns and get the messages. That's the idea. I, I, I do think it's possible. It seems to me that it's possible based on everything that I've... Um, so that's sort of, they call that the cosmic waterhole in the sense that it could be a place of quiet where we might be able to search and find radio transmissions from, from intelligent extraterrestrial life. Uh, all right, so, so let's see. So now, I mean, expanding it even further in terms of where would you look for life in solar systems beyond our own. Maybe I'll pull up this slide. This is... Let's see. Let me pull up one of my later slides. Let's see. Hold on one second for me, please. That's not the one I want. It's just taking a little while for these slides to res now. So this is one that I wanted. So this is a uh, star map. So in the, uh, in the neighborhood of the sun, I forget the scale on this. So you can see at the bottom, the scale is like five light years. So it's pretty distant. But in the neighborhood of the sun, as you get a few light years out, so this is the, the distance where it takes light a few years to get to you. So it's pretty far. But there's only this... It's maybe hard to see, but there's one star, I think it's called Proxima, close to the sun. 
But then if, as you go out 15, 20, 40, 50 light years out, um, you increase by geometric proportions the amount of star systems and potential planets, exoplanets, moons, and therefore places that could potentially harbor life and maybe even intelligent life that could be sending you radio signals. So um, it gets interesting when you get out, you know, I don't know, 25, 50 light years or more. There's just a lot. There's a lot of uh, star systems. Um, let's see. Just reading here, it depends on the strength of the transmitter, the radio environment. Syzygy, this is another thing where I wish I knew what you knew, I, what you know about this, really. Like, I don't know all those details. It's hard to find out. But it seems like it's possible. So uh, that'd, be something, that'd be something to talk about sometime. Anyway, so um, let's see. Just for giggles, this is uh, Proxima Centauri. This is the sun's nearest stellar neighbor. Just for the heck of it, I think I spelled it wrong. I should fix that. Um, so, let's see. What else should I show? Um, well, I have some slides on um, like um, habitable zones, but I'm not sure it's worth showing. So there's some speculation that there's this habitable zone um, of a certain distance from every star, where it's kind of not too hot, not too cold, they sometimes call it the Goldilocks zone, or if you have planets, moons in that range, you could have liquid water, you could have life. I, they, I don't know. Uh, it, it, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. Um, anyway, so uh, maybe I'll go to my last slide, or what should I go to now? Actually, this is a cool slide that I want to show, just because it's attractive. Um, actually, it might take me too long to find that. So I guess I'll stop at that. Um, or actually, give me one second. I want to find an article. No, it's going to take too long. So um, that's pretty much the 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 uh, the long and the short of my uh, of my presentation. Um, in terms of the, uh, I'm just going to throw a slide up here. Um, this is Enceladus. So it's about 40 minutes into the presentation, and I don't know. That's sort of just a uh, a highlight of of these uh, of these things that I've been looking into. So let me read some chat. Um, see, it depends on the telescope and atmospheric scene and their angular separation. Yeah, when they arrive, they will request take me to Led Zeppelin. Isn't B rocky? So I'm not sure where to um. Where to go from here? I guess, I don't know, I kind of would like to talk about Mars. So I'm going to go back to my Mars slide because it's in the news right now. So I think it's kind of, it's just relevant generally. Um, so hang on a minute while I do that. Um, I had that up earlier, actually, liquid water phase physics. And this is 1A3A. Hang on one second for me, please. God, I hate the inventory in Second Life. Three. So, so this, I might have showed, I think I showed this slide earlier, so I don't want to harp on it too much, but if there is liquid water in on Mars or in Mars, then it's an intriguing possibility to find life. So this slide shows that the bottom slide, it's kind of complicated, but the, the, the bottom line here is that the range of conditions on Mars, where it says range on Mars, that circle, that allows for liquid water to exist is really, really narrow. So unless there's some weird stuff going on in Mars, like magma creating heat, then there's going to be no significant amount of stable liquid water on Mars. Um, but uh, if that turns out not to be the case, then it gets interesting. Um, when we send radio signal out to the universe, it would not be encrypted. Is that right? How do we send the signal out on some kind of broad range signal? Checking on Google, their angular separation. Yeah, that gets beyond my knowledge. The, the details, details of it get a little beyond uh, my knowledge. Hey, babe, could you not be too noisy? I'm kind of presenting. Thanks. Um, 
let's see. Um, is there any um, particular topic that anyone especially wants to hear about? Like, I have a lot of details on a lot of different topics from organic chemistry to cellular metabol metabolism. Venus, you know, I don't have too much on Venus. Um, it, it, is there any, wasn't there something in the news on Venus? Because I, I don't remember Venus coming up on my astrobiology radar. Um, let's see. Perchlorate salts in the Martian soil can allow, yeah, so this idea that salts in the Martian soil can allow water to remain liquid down very low is interesting, but it still doesn't seem, I got the sense that it still wasn't possible to have liquid water on Mars, um, unless there's some sort of source of heat within Mars, unless I'm wrong. Um, yeah, I don't know enough about Venus either, it seems, it seems unlikely, uh, so the idea isn't that there would be liquid water on or in Venus, is it? Is it? That, that doesn't seem possible, but maybe I'm missing something. Anyway, I should maybe stick to what I know here. So, let me see. Well, maybe I'll back up. Um, um, maybe talk about liquid water or organic chemistry. Maybe liquid water is the interesting thing. Um, I'm going to pull up my liquid water slide. 1A3. Hang on a second for me, please. So, well, this is a, let's see, uh, Venus could have acidophilic, thermophilic extremophiles in its clouds. Well, right, but if it, it had if it had extremophile microbes in its clouds, they would have to be gas based, not not liquid solvent based, I think. Um, so that that would be fascinating, but pretty radical. Um, yeah, I mean it does it does seem like Mars is pretty dead. Um, Right. Drops of yeah, drops. Of, I mean, from what I hear, drops of water. What I read, even drops of water probably wouldn't be enough for life as we know it. You'd need bodies, stable, significant bodies of water. Um. So let's see. Droplets, uh, fifty miles upward is one atmosphere pressure, maybe. Yeah, I mean. Droplets of water are interesting, but I can't see it being enough for life to evolve. Um, and yeah, you, you, you do have to have an uh, energy source. Um, that's another issue. But I mean, just how it would exist without without water as a solvent, I don't know. You know, the, the transfer of molecules in and out of the cellular membranes and everything, it really requires a significant body of liquid water. Um, anyway, so this slide I have up is really not attractive looking. But it talks about all the different reasons why liquid water seems to be critical for life. Um, it's liquid phase under a big range of conditions. Um, and, and life, it, it needs liquid. Generally, life as we know it needs liquid for the reactions and the movement of the molecules. Um, and also, um, uh, water uh, has this polar configuration, which turns out to dissolve many substances, and that makes it much easier for chemistry of life to happen. And that's why people think liquid water is, is probably uh, probably necessary for life. Uh, anyway, let me go to a more interesting looking sign. Um, um, let me see here. I'm just trying to find out, a, figure out a good slide to show. So another thing is, what would be the chemical sort of backbone on life? Everybody, life on Earth has as its sort of chemical backbone carbon. Here's a slide on that. One, a, four. So these are the different structures that carbon. Carbon is basically a molecule that can take all sorts of forms, and that gives it great versatility uh, for forming the sort of chemical backbone of life. But let me read this here. Um, Venus has been the way it is for 700 million years. Life could have gotten started in the first 2 billion years when the sun was thinner. Yeah, that sounds possible to me. Not now, but then. 
This is on the inner edge of the Goldilocks zone. That's interesting. Uh, its atmosphere is like hell, yeah. Uh, and then Venus, uh, and then as Venus became less hospitable, its life might have followed a habitable zone. I mean, that part, who knows? Um, life in a, in a, in a non-liquid ocean or lake is, have to be, I think, radically different than life as we know it, but it's, but it's conceivable. Um, let's see. So there's 15 minutes left, and I'm just trying to think of uh, what anybody what might be interested in. Um, is there any particular topic that people uh, find the most interesting? A particular uh, planet or a topic in this area? If there is, let me know. Otherwise, I'll just find something. Um, let me see what might be interesting. So some of this stuff gets kind of detailed, so I just want to show stuff that is more visible. Um, so I'm going to look for a slide. Um, biochemistry, maybe? No, I talked about that. Organic chemistry. Maybe organic chemistry is kind of an interesting topic. Um, so let's see, 1A6. Let me pull up another slide. 1A6. Six. Six page three. Eh, this is not too interesting. So this is more of a, let, let me read this now. Um, See, this stuff is just too much text, so I've got to find, let me find a uh, slide that's not all text. This is kind of an interesting one, I'll go with that. So this is 1A8. I'm just pulling up a slide, give me a second. Yeah, so... uh. A lot of my slides are, are just kind of a lot of text. I, I found this an interesting slide. So in the search for microbes beyond Earth, how, how are you going to find them without actually being there? Well, it turns out that the chemical action of, of uh, microscopic uh, microbes, bacteria uh, and other microbes, can create macroscopic uh, observable characteristics that can even be observed through um, uh, uh, telescope work. So. And, and, and other ways. So this this shot is the atmosphere of Earth, and um, the 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 atmosphere of Earth is blue is visible in this blue area. So what's interesting is that about what is it 19 percent or 21 percent? I forget the exact number, but about a fifth of the entire Earth Earth's atmosphere is elemental oxygen O2, uh, which is the main source. Uh, uh, the main source of that has been photosynthesis by cellular life. So 21%. So 21%, thanks, Syzygy, of the entire Earth's atmosphere is elemental oxygen that was produced by microscopic microbes um, performing photosynthesis. Um, so, I see, that it varies. So you can potentially find chemical signatures in atmospheres that you can make guesses. Like if someone were to observe that the atmosphere of Earth was so much oxygen, they might guess where did it come from. It might have come from uh, photosynthetic life, and that guess would be right. Um, and people have been looking at the atmospheres of moons in the solar system for those kinds of signatures, um, those kinds of uh, buildup of chemicals that suggest life. Algae farts, yeah. Um, let's see, there's about 10 minutes left. I'm not really sure. I don't hear a lot of chat about any particular topic. Um, so I'll look for another pretty picture. Let's see. Talked about Europa. Um, Ammonia is a solvent. Talked about that. I'm just looking for another slide that might be an interesting uh, visual image. Carbon. Talked about that. 
different elements of life. A lot of this just gets into uh, details that I don't think would be too exciting to show. Um, let me look at some of my articles. This might take a minute, so bear with me if you don't mind. I'm going to look for some article slides that have interesting, easy to, to see images. Let's throw them up one at a time and see what happens. It's just taking a little while for these to res, it seems. Maybe because of the traffic. So uh, this is just an interesting uh, speculative image. So this is an artist's rendition. Um, all right, an envisioned habitable moon. This would be the view from a hypothetical moon. So the large surface that you're looking at in this image would be the view that you might see from around the moon um, with an atmosphere and liquid surface water. Um, and it's inspired by an exoplanet. Um, so you would see the, the host planet and other moons. And it could be that there are moons like this in star systems with life. Let's see what I got here. Uh, five quintillion tons of atmosphere. Yeah. I'm going to throw some other article images up just because some of the images are interesting. This is another artist rendition. Hopefully this shows pretty quickly. Do you guys, do you guys see the uh, yellowish planet with the bluish moon in front of it at this point? Can you tell me? Okay, good. At least these slides are coming up quickly, even if I'm not finding them that quickly. So this is an interesting uh, slide. Um, another artist's rendition. You could have a habitable moon that's kind of Earth-like uh, orbiting a planet. Um, and this would be the, the view from around the moon, um, which would be interesting. Like a scum covering its circus. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, it's interesting how life uh, is, is on this, this thin, relatively thin surface of Earth. And, and anywhere, probably. Let me throw another image. Some of these articles have interesting images, so a little picture show at the end. Yeah. Um, another uh, hypothetical exoplanet. So if these exoplanets exist and have water, they might look kind of Earth-like and something like this. I'm just going to move on and go through some slide, some picture slides. Oh, this is one of my favorite. Uh, I'd say this is probably my favorite artist's rendition image. Um, I don't know why, but um, it just seems very... Uh, uh, science fiction to me. So imagine that you were on um, the surface of another planet. This is so it would have a very different sky, very different geology, but you can see it could have liquid surface water. And in the sky, there's um, two suns. Uh, so this is just an artist's rendition of something very exotic and different from Earth. Ugly bags of mostly water. Sumo, I don't remember that. Uh, I don't remember that saying from Star Trek ugly bags of mostly water. Um, I, I, the, what I like to imagine is when, when life presumably uh, came out of the oceans, you know, the primordial oceans, it sort of took the water with it, it uh, and thus bags, bags of mostly water. I mean, we, we can't live without water, so when life came on to land, the cells had to keep the water, and the organisms had to keep the water within it so that the chemical exchanges could happen and life uh, could exist. You just have to have water, unless there's life that's radically different than life on Earth. I think liquid-based life, based on a liquid other than just water, is possible. Maybe a mixture of hydrocarbons and water. The chemistry gets complicated. Um, I, I, I find that life, be, life that's not based on carbon, maybe silicon, and life that's not uh, liquid-based is hard to envision. It would have to be radically different than life on Earth from everything that I know. But that still leaves a lot of room, and there's a lot of, it turns out there's a lot of liquid water, apparently, even in the solar system, much less the galaxy. So I'm going to put another image up. It's a lot easier than finding articles. So, so this is back to Titan, my favorite, um, my favorite candidate for, uh, life beyond Earth. Um, 
we have methane polar clouds uh, in essentially the atmosphere of Titan um, compared with polar clouds on Earth. Uh, interestingly similar. You wonder if there might be other similarities. All right. Um, and of course, Titan has liquid lakes. Yeah, I don't. I, yeah, Titan to me seems seems a bit. The idea of liquid hydrocarbon lakes is intriguing to me. And there was an article written a long time ago by an astrophysicist. I think Chris McKay is his name. That it, it gets detailed, but there's ob Telescope observations of the surface of Titan suggest, and I think this is a slide that actually talks about it, in fact. Anyway, um, there have been telescope observations of the surface of Titan that suggest that there are uh, hydrocarbon sort of emissions in, in the atmosphere of Titan that could have been created by, I think, methanogenic life uh, metabolizing. Tuma says yes, so maybe it sort of, oh, no, this was the silicon-based life. Yeah, silicon-based life is another possibility, although it seems speculative. Anyway, so on Titan, uh, there there's chemical signatures of molecules in the atmosphere, and I forget the details, but they suggest that they could have been metabolized by, I think, methanogenic bacteria that could live in the hydrocarbon lakes, methane-related, or with methane lakes, on literally on Titan. So uh, that's pretty interesting, I think. Um, and then, you know, you get into carbon, so there's water. So life needs liquid, uh, probably, and maybe it needs water, but it seems to also need carbon because all the, the the chemical structures of life are sort of built around carbon. But it's possible that another chemically varying molecule, like uh, or element like silicon, could be the basis. Although it seems it would just have to be completely radically different than life on Earth, just like in Star Trek. Um, we're almost done now, so. Um, I'll go through a little bit more, but if anybody has any other questions, I'm happy to stay on or whatever. I'll just go through a couple more slides. Daisy, my favorite plot line in Star Trek is the idea that Voyager was captured by a planet with machine life who discovered Voyager's mission and reprogrammed it to fulfill the mission, gather all the knowledge, and return the knowledge to its creator. I didn't see that one. This is maybe not too exciting, but archaea are a very early form of microbe uh, present on early and they still exist today and I think they exist uh, around hydrothermal vents which are interesting because you get sort of non life that lives under under the sea not not with energy not provided by the Sun so this is at least a pretty picture um, speaking of arch archaea um, I don't even I might be pronouncing it wrong but archaea are a type of microorganism, this ancient form of life, and they can exist, uh, they exist still on Earth, and they show that life can endure all sorts of extremes, which makes life beyond Earth more possible. These archaea live around these, um, I think, uh, hydro hydrothermal vents um, with great extremes of temperature and salt and whatnot. Down to the last minute here. So this is just the Mars rover on the surface of Mars. Pretty cool. Probably not life, I don't think, but pretty cool. Hopefully these are resin quick enough, but it seems like they are. What is this? I don't know yet. I have to let it res. I think this is just really cool. This is a really high, I don't know how clear it is to you guys, but this is a high-res image of the surface of Mars. It just It's just striking to me how similar the geologies of the surfaces of other planets are to Earth. I'll bet it's, it seems to me it's probably like that even many, many light years away. There's so many similarities, you have to think that maybe life is something that is similar too, you know, so it could exist elsewhere. Let me see, maybe one or two more slides. Arid, desolate, yeah, that's Mars. But it's possible it existed before we missed it. Life on Mars, early in Mars's history, seems entirely possible. Oh, this one I showed already. So it's it's after two o'clock. So uh, maybe I should stop. How about one more slide? 
Let's see what this one is. It's taking me a little while for it to res. Oh, more Titan. Eh, we had enough Titan. Titan, Titan, Titan. I'm just throwing up maybe one more slide. This is kind of an interesting one. This is an array of telescopes that maybe one day will help us find radio signals from extraterrestrial life. I've only got a few more slides, so maybe I'll look at one or two more. I'm just waiting for this one to res. Yeah, so back to Contact, which I just loved. Um, especially the start to the movie was just so exciting. This would be the greatest thing, to find and decode radio transmissions from extraterrestrial life. Um, all right, so it's after 2 o'clock. So um, uh, I guess I'll stop with the, the presentation as such. Um, yeah, it looks completely realistic to me. We radio astronomers are always outside next to antennas. Uh, Syzygy, uh, have you actually done radio astronomy? That's fascinating. Hey, thank you very much, Shiloh. That's, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, you're welcome, Brioni. Thank you all for, uh, for, for checking it out. Appreciate it. Thanks, Day. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Tagline. I appreciate it. Thanks, Baragon. Thank you, Syzygy. Thanks for the applause, Baragon. I appreciate everybody coming. If anybody uh, has wants to talk about anything, um, please feel free to uh, please please feel free to IM me or friend me or whatever. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit, but um, the presentation is basically over, so feel free to not listen. How did you go from microbiology to research to patent law? Dave, thanks for asking. Um, uh, let me think now. So I did my microbiology research in graduate school when I was studying environmental science, but then after I graduated, there wasn't a lot of good work, unless I wanted to go for a PhD, and that seemed like a little much. And environmental, in environmental science, I took a, a course in environmental law, and then I found out about patent law, which seemed like a nice way to combine my science background, my language, interest in language. I like language and English. And that's kind of how I gravitated to patent law. In retrospect, I kind of wish I stayed in microbiology. It would have been cool to research microbiology. Um, patent attorneys have to have science. Yeah, that's right. Patent attorneys have to have a science degree in order to, in order to become a patent attorney. Tagline, yeah, I did go to law school about a thousand years ago. Yeah, to be a patent attorney, you have to have a long background. You have to have a, a, a law degree, and you have to pass a bar exam for at least one state, and you have to pass the patent agent or patent bar exam, which, in order to take that exam, you have to have a science degree, basically. It's kind of complicated. But it makes for a good area, because not too many people can do it. So I'm going to stick around, but I'm not, I'm not necessarily going to keep uh, constantly talking. But if anybody wants to uh, chat me or talk, um, I'll be around for a bit. Thanks again. Thanks a lot, Sumo. Daisy, did I ever work for SETI? No. Um, I didn't. I would love to. <laughs> I would rather work for NASA or SETI or something intriguing. But no. <laughs>